Frida's at uh, at Balls, Balls Radio. If you want to get involved in the show today, as I said, I'm flying solo, so I will really appreciate some extra banter over the Twitter. Uh, if you are watching us, this of course is Balls Visual Radio, you'll see I'm wearing quite an interesting shirt today. Uh, no, I didn't fall into a pool of paint, and this is what kind of gathered on my chest. I went to the Puma Creator Factory over the weekend, and uh, this is actually a photograph that's been developed onto my shirt. Uh, as you can see, it's been overdeveloped, um, so it does look like a blue blob, but there's a really good story behind it, so uh, don't be alarmed. Uh, my dress sense hasn't completely gone. There is still an inch of it left. Uh, today we're going to get into the headlines first up. Just again, we have Keegan Kruger coming on, and he'll actually have a bit more time with him today, seeing as Sean is not with us in the studio. And then we've got rugby and cricket correspondents all the way from Australia even. Wow, the show is, has become international. It's been the seventh show, I suppose, we had to add up the ante. So getting into your headlines, uh, the Proteus beat Pakistan. Uh, this is again after a bit of a crushing loss uh, the day be- or the, the game before. But a series win of 3-2 nonetheless is a huge confidence booster for this one-day side. A one-day side that we all know is a big underperformer. And with that, they recorded their 300th win. And in that, Dale Stane got his 100th ODI wicket. Uh, a wicket that was no other than Muhammad Hafiz. Yeah, it's quite a love affair the two of them got going. Hafiz definitely on the receiving end, so to speak. Jerry Collins, well, his arrest story is progressing. Uh, of course, last week we spoke about the fact that he was bust carrying what was a slightly larger than usual kitchen knife in a Japanese apartment store. Well, it turns out that Jerry was actually, well, allegedly being chased by a gang of um, angry Brazilians who seem to don't like, not like uh, <laughs> foreign rugby players. Now, that just sounds like the most cooked up story going. A whole bunch of Brazilian guys hating rugby players. I don't know where he got that from. So anyway, Jerry uh, went in there and he was apparently in quite a state. So then <laughs> a cop was alerted to his presence and the fact that he was sort of brandishing this, this sword, this weapon. So the cop came into the department store and he basically saw the size of Jerry, who's this six foot four, rather menacing looking Maori gent. And he called for backup. Now, within minutes, there was about 30 cops that streamed into the department store just to kind of, you know, <laughs> bring Jerry to justice. I, I, I don't know. Apparently, there's a, there's a chance that he could do jail time because the length of his blade was um, put into like a, a real dangerous weapon. It's a dodgy story, but it hasn't gone away. So perhaps Jerry, who's still in police custody, apparently, could be in a spot of bother. Into the India whitewash series of Australia, they, of course, won the fourth and final test, making it 4-0, a 4-0 whitewash. Australia in all kinds of bother at the moment. They had, every test had its own little issue, you know, from the homework to the lack of captaincy, different captains being involved, players getting dropped. Um, Michael Clark, you know, he's got everything to do going into the Ashes series. So in about half an hour's time, 45 minutes' time, we're going to go into that whole um, Indian-Australia series with our um, Aussie correspondent. He no doubt has some really, really great insights to share with us. Staying with Test Cricket, the Palms held on this morning to the rampant Black Caps. Now, this was quite an intriguing series. Of course, we bent New Zealand over the barrel here, winning 3-0 without any sort of real troubles. But it, but um, New Zealand, rather, are a bit of a different beast uh, down in their own little uh, country. And they were basically, they had the tendency over England the entire Test series. You know, they... They had them on the ropes in that second one. The first one was mostly rain-affected. But now in this third one, they literally needed, I think, six wickets in the final day. And it came down right to the final over. Trent Bolt, unfortunately, couldn't hit a cow's ass with a banjo in the bowling sense. And uh, Monty Panesar saw him off. And they drew the test. Uh, Matt Pryor with a brilliant 110 not out there. The test cricket, as always, alive and well, which is quite fitting, seeing as we're about to go into the IPL, which is, well, it's... It's basically cricket's whorehouse, and uh, I can't see that thing attracting too much sincere attention going forward. But anyway, you'll see the airwaves lighting up with IPL soon. Going on to Formula One. Yep, first time we ever featuring Formula One on the show, and it will be very, very short. Uh, Vettel apparently didn't obey team orders. Now, what happened was that Weber was primed for the win. Team management said, you can turn the engines down a bit. We've got this in the bag. Let's just conserve the car, conserve the tires, get through and just get the win. But then Vettel apparently didn't hear this, or he had other ideas, and he overtook Weber, and there was one real pissed off Aussie. We're actually going to get to that story a little bit more in our tweet section today, um, in the most unlikely of forms of Boris Becker bringing that story to life. 
on to football. Bafana won 2-0 versus the Central African Republic over the weekend. A story which unfortunately has been marred by other things happening in the Central African Republic with South African soldiers. But uh, for Gordon Iggerson, well done. That's a good win. It's a morale booster after the obviously African Cup of Nations and disappointment around that. Into rugby we go. Uh, we're going to get into rugby a lot more with Mornay from Rugger World uh, a little bit further into this first hour. But essentially what happened over the weekend was two, sorry, um, just talking about some fisticuffs, which is basically our way of saying bringing in the Aussies. Cooper Vuna and Kurtley Beale have been sent home. Now the Rebels, as you know, got completely pasted by the Sharks. A 10 try drubbing. And then after a couple of boozers later on in the team bus, there was fisticuffs and... Uh, Cooper Vuno and Kurt Bill are now out. Again, we've got a little bit more of that story in our tweet section. But uh, that Kurt Bill, now let's just talk about his future in Aussie, in Aussie rugby, if the Rebels still want him. Of course, he actually has a case, um, a sort of a bar brawl case pending against him at the moment. So this doesn't exactly bode well for young Kurt Lee, who's still he's a fantastically talented player. You know, And if, if this uh, sort of... Um, Latest transgression gets in his way, he could even miss the Lions test, which is making Robbie Deans look even more constipated than usual. Uh, our final headline for today is about golf. Yesterday, the um, rain delayed Arnold Palmer Invitational at Bay Hill uh, was finished on a Monday, with Tiger Woods going into the round two shots ahead of Ricky Fowler. Ricky came, came very close. He got, it, he got it towards a couple of shots, and then he got eight on a par five. Tiger's he's just looking back to his best. You know, to think at one stage he was 58th in the world. With this win now, he is now number world, world number one again. And uh, with uh, Roy McIlroy looking at sixes and sevens at the moment, as far as getting used to his new clubs and, of course, this new dealership with or deal with Nike, Tiger really is just uh, hands-on favorite to go into um, the Masters. I think he actually, this is his 77th PGA Tour win. Now, to put that into perspective, if you've won maybe once or twice on the PGA Tour, you're generally known as, as quite a golfer. You know, you, you, you're set financially for life. You get uh, sponsor exemptions going forward, and you definitely are within the top 100 and doing very well in golf. Tiger has won 77 times, and he's won eight times alone at the Bay Hill Classic, which is, well, the, sorry, the um, Arnold Palmer Invitational. A really an amazing feat from an amazing golfer. And a lot of people say it's really good that uh, he's back in the game. Well, I still have my doubts about him, but hey, I'm going to put this aside and just congratulate him on really a fantastic, fantastic victory. So those are your headlines for the week. We do have a few more things coming up in the um, in the tweet section, which we're going to come back to after this. But first, we're going to have a little bit of Calvin Harris. Oh, no, wait, sorry. That's not Calvin Harris. <laughs> Bruno Mars. Catch you back after this. All 12 right here on balls.co.za. Okay, so no Sean today. Flying solo is a whole lot more difficult. Uh, we do have the presence of one Simon Hill, but man, he's a busy boy today. He is station manager here at Balls, and of course, he works on the FM between 3 and 6 every single day on Mix FM 93.8 with the afternoon show with Darren and John and Knox. Be sure to get more Balls the afternoon with them and the team. So we're going to go into our tweets. This is our weekly feature where we see what's happening out in the world of uh, Twitter. Also, just a nice way of touching on certain stories. So, um, as you know, it's just a great a great place for celebrities to also make complete asses of themselves. And we're going to start with... Well, actually, none of them really made asses of themselves. Now, this this whole feature started basically between um, James O'Connor and Quade Cooper and their sort of love affair that's going on between them. Now, obviously, I mean that in a very like, tongue-in-cheek fashion. But now, Cooper Vuna, who we spoke about, has been involved in a bit of a altercation with Kurt Lee Beale. Now, Cooper Vuna tweeted... At C. Vuna, that um, he was trying to help somebody out and then got took a punch. But rather than putting that person in hospital, he's just going to leave. Now, he then retracted that tweet and deleted it. But essentially what he was saying was that um, he got he was trying to help somebody out in his team and then Kurt Lee Beale gave him a smack. So he has to go home now. Oh, these Aussies. Speaking of Aussies, uh, David Campisi, of course, he is our, our go-to guy on the Twitter so many good insights coming from him. Uh, he was kind of away from the action to, uh, this last weekend as far as rugby's concerned. But he had some pretty interesting insights as far as young young people, young players in general. You know, we speak about Kurt Lee Bill going off the handle. And Kepa has some pretty good insights around this. At David Campisi 11. That's what's wrong. Sorry. Young players always out in the town. Always in the paper for the wrong reasons. But it's all right. Get paid and move on. We should never do it. 
Uh, sorry, we would never do it. David, obviously, drawing back to the days that he was, you know, a, an old pro, and when they had a few beers, they did it in a gentlemanly fashion. There was no um, boxing afterwards. So then he goes on to say, that's wrong with some players. Think that they are superstars and don't care. Listen or respect their elders. Always thinking about themselves. So then he goes on to have, and there's nothing about Campo. He always has a good banter with pretty much anybody who will tweet at him. Um... You're talking about young players, and then he had a bit of a chat to Brianna Chris. You think about what has happened. Kim Kardashian makes a porno and is now a star. YouTube and all that crap. TV on now. Shows no respect. Now, David, you also got to kind of try to depict what he's actually saying in his, in his tweets. He does speak in a sort of different language. But essentially what he's saying is that nowadays all players, you know, they rise to stardom. They, um, they take everything with a pinch of salt, and the cracks are starting to show with some players really falling away. So good on you, David. I appreciate those sentiments. And on to cricket now. We just we spoke about how Australia took an absolute, absolute hammering. But there was one guy uh, who did pretty well in that last test, Peter Siddle. He became the first ever test batsman to bat number nine and score 50 in both innings. So at Pavilion Opinion, sorry, at Pavilion Opinion got onto this. And he had this to say, what do you call a decent Aussie cricketer? A vegetarian. That's pretty good. Siddle, of course, he, he, he gave, he turned his back on meat, uh, I think about 18 months ago. Um, and being an Australian, he obviously got a lot of, uh, took a lot of flack for that. Moving on to Alt Cricket, at Alt Cricket, big favorite with us. Uh, he had this to say about A.B. de Villiers. He got the Man of the Series award for the one-day series against Pakistan and the Test Series. He really is just a man of form at the moment. At Alt Cricket, this is here. It was a great team effort, said Captain. Man of the match and man of the series, Abe de Villiers, especially by me, myself, and Abe. So, like everybody is touching on to the fact that you know he is such a special player, and it's just great to see him kind of progress through the challenges that he took on. Obviously, the big thing about being captain, wicket keeper, star batsman, uh, childhood sweetheart, pop icon, heartthrob. You know, Abe does essentially do absolutely everything. Getting on to a tweet with absolutely no relevance whatsoever to any of our stories this week, but I just thought it was quite funny. At Mario Bolatelli, the um, Chelsea striker, sorry, not Chelsea, the Man City striker who then went on to uh, AC Milan, he had this to say about Roman Abramovich. Breaking news, Roman, Abram- Roman Abramovich has been arrested in the US. Apparently spending 50 million on Fernando Torres really is a crime. It's pretty funny for those of you who do like the football. Uh, and our final tweet this week Wow, this really isn't much fun. Let's say I've got Sean to chat about this. <laughs> anyway, final two of the week. We we spoke about uh, the F1 and how Sebastian Vettel sort of took a gap that wasn't really meant to be taken. So uh, Vettel's a bit of a ginger. Uh, if you look at him with his hat off, you'll definitely see a, a shade of copper coming through on his hair. So naturally, as the gingers stick together, at the Boris Becker, the one and only Boris Becker, the original Alpha Ranger, he came to the defense of the German F1 star. Just watch the highlights of Malaysian Grand Prix. Vettel did what a, did what a three times champ is supposed to do. Take matters in own in your own hand. Wow, cutthroat sport. Boris does make a good point though. Of course, he was that very cutthroat tennis player who won Wimbledon at the age of 17 and then went on to, well, he was pretty much one of the big charismatic stars of, of men's tennis, which don't exist anymore. So, yeah, well, I think when Sasha comes in, I'm sure he's going to talk about it again on his show later on, Gears. That is the show after this show, which is 12 until 2. Personally, I just think it's another damning indictment of our F1 and what an absolute fast it is. So, not much on the on the Twitter sphere this week, uh, this last week. Uh, like I said, our favorites have become very quiet. Uh, Stuart Brody lover is still just obsessed, but she hasn't really changed her game. Uh, she's still a police risk, in my personal opinion. And, um, yeah, Sean's been away, Sport Billy's been away, so we're going to get back to some more tracks, and then we're going to come back, and we change to Keegan from the Pundits in the next 10 minutes. We've got, yeah, like a nice lot of, of international friendies to talk about, obviously there's Bafana's win as well, and just whatever else is happening in the world of football. That's, of course, coming up after this from Calvin Harris, was acceptable in the 80s. Boris Becker was acceptable in the 80s. Follow him on Twitter, you'll agree to see why. Calvin Harris feels so close to you right now. But I already met. Keegan, are you with us? Uh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm absolutely dying in studio today. This whole radio gig is a lot more difficult when you haven't got someone to talk to. 
Yeah, you look quite lonely out there today. I feel it too, huh? I really do. I'm getting a strange face from Maz, and that's pretty much it. I get the odd <laughs> nod from Simon. But yeah, Sean's not here. Hey, but anyway. Things are running on time today, though. Um, oh. Yeah, because I've got bug, roll, <laughs> got bug roll to talk about. It's funny how time flies. Well, well content flies when it's just one guy. Yeah, so how have you been? How was the weekend? What happened in the world of football that we should know about over the weekend? Week has been good, actually. Um, started off, obviously, at the Bafana game on Saturday. And um, good win for Gordon and his boys. Um, really played well. Um, one or two... Um, Scary incidences. We had a little handball, which was given, then wasn't given. Yeah, that was quite, <laughs> but pretty blatant. Huh? I mean, that's got some mad volleyball skills. No, no. Listen, I was sitting on the far side of the stand, so I couldn't really see what was going on. I was asking Twitter to actually send me some replays. All oh, right, send so me some photos to see if it was handball or not. So to you, thought, to you, it looked like a good header. Yeah, I thought it was a good header at one <laughs> stage, and then I thought maybe Safa just paid a few, a few bit of cash somewhere, <laughs> and. Um, get the linesman on their side, but no, it was legit. Um, Tabo McClaba's goal was absolutely magnificent, that, really. That long-range effort. It was brilliant. Yeah, that was out, one of the best strikes uh, I've ever seen. Yeah, outside the big box. I mean, it even made it onto world news. It was being retweeted. Um, the goal has been tweeted by 101 goals. A um, few um, football pundits out there, 4-4 four, four, Tom, you know, it was really going, making the rounds in world wow. football. Um, yeah, and then... Um, Poor Dean Furman got got a nasty cut under the eye, which um, he had to go off early. I saw a lot of people talking about that. Uh, soccer being such a aesthetically pleasing sport, that could be the end of his career. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't look great at start, but um, and especially the photos going around after the game it looked pretty blue, and he suffered a bit of concussion. But they say he's right, and he should be ready for. For the next for their next game, so yeah, things looking good on the final side. They need to get two wins if they want to go into the sure. want to go to Brazil. So yeah, job not done yet. Yeah, okay, Keegan, look, I think we've got quite a lot to talk about in your little section today. Um, you've got a, a blog post that you want to talk about, and then just get into some of the other friendlies that happened around um, that we need to catch up on from last week. Um, yeah. I just want to ask you one thing though. Again, this is me as much educating myself as it is sort of broadcasting it. But something I always find quite interesting, right? Now, if the Springboks had to play Namibia, we're expecting an 80-plus scoreline. Um, you know, if you just look at socioeconomic backgrounds, the ability for teams to actually be professional and put a team on the field. Now, SA is, you would say, should be a powerhouse of African football, right? But then we find these countries that have literally been made like last week. I mean, Central African Republic, they, they were the Congo once upon a time, right? Uh, you are, uh, they are, no, there's no, the DRC. they were like DRC, but then there was, anyway, these guys come together and I can't imagine that they're living like the high life, you know, so they, I'm sure a lot of them like work in hotel bars and pardon my ignorance here, but they can't be like the swish sort of outfit that we have the ability to put on. But then again, all these teams always push us. Like you name yeah, it, I, you name a team in Africa, every game is going to be close. How is it that it's so different in football compared to in like in cricket or rugby when a minnow plays a strong one, there's only one result. I think a lot's got to do, funny enough, with like natural talent, natural ability. I mm. mean, rugby is very technical if you think about it. Yeah, in good ways. If you, um, you know, if you're scrumming, line out, you know, it's a very technical, technical game where football is based, a lot of it comes down to natural ability, natural talent. And to be honest with you, there's so many gifted, natural, naturally gifted players all yeah. over Africa. And whether they have the coaching or they don't have the coaching. Um, Africa is not an easy place to play, and let me tell you that. Um, you, you can see some of the pictures some of these guys play on, and you look at guys like South Africa and, and Nigeria, maybe even some of the Cam Cameroon, you've got Ivory Coast. These boys are playing European football. They're getting the best out of the best pitches um, and facilities, so they're sort of being spoilt in a way. They come back to Africa, they play in the DRC, mm -hmm. they play in Niger, and things don't go their way, and Niger. they're struggling. You know, Niger, sorry, <laughs> they and they're struggling. Yeah, I mean, really, it's um, it's a tough place to play football on this continent. Really, it's yeah. not easy. Well, is this? Yeah, it's interesting because these World Cup qualifiers. You know, if you would just look at it from the outside, you think you know we shouldn't have any problems against teams like Ethiopia and you know places where they like. Central African Republic again you know there's just there's a place of turmoil you can't imagine there'd be a great culture of solid football coming out of that but anyway as you say you make some good points there you do uh, want to chat about Ajax this morning 
Um, you, we yes, we've got a post that we're busy. Um, we had um, a meeting with Ajax a few weeks ago, and uh, we they've come they. The one thing with the PSL, and I think you all know that, is getting bums on seats. Yep. And, I think uh, it's quite similar with uh, Curry Cup and Super Rugby. <laughs> well, n- not really, but we'll, <laughs> I think we'll get the court, not even caught to the amount of those fans coming to football games. Mm. So, I actually really want to start building a culture, and, um, and especially for fans, um, getting fans and families down to football games, as we used to see back in the 80s when there was Hellenic and Cape Town Spurs, used to have a quick 20,000 yeah. people at, um, at Greenpoint Stadium. Mm-hmm. And we would like to know where the, where has that fans gone to or where they've disappeared to. They all go to the sport um, HD. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it seems like it. And a lot of parties on a Friday night these days. Yeah. But yeah, we've come up with, um, with IX. I mean, um, they've come up with a very nice um, sort of an idea where it's called Block 116. Now, block 116 is something that it's obviously a block in the stand, right opposite the um, right opposite the, the I can sort of say the dugouts. Yep. On the halfway line, and this is what they want to make into a little IX sort of area. Okay, IX only area, and they are hoping that through you know obviously through the season and through next season we can start building that IX section bigger and bigger and bigger over mm-hmm. two or three blocks. That's a great idea. And so we're really encouraging fans to go out and get tickets and actually go and buy your ticket in Block 116. Um, when Kaiser Chiefs comes to town or uh, Atlanta Pirates come to town, you know, they seem to take over the stadium. And we, um, we're in Cape Town. We should, have, we should have the predominant fans in that stadium. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to really start off small and try and grow the project a hell of a lot bigger. Um, yeah, and we've come up with a thing with IX where they're willing to sell tickets for 40 Rand. Um, a normal PSL that's, ticket goes for about 60. That's two beers um, as well. That's two beers. It's yeah, two not beers. Much. <laughs> um, you can get 40 Rand. You'll get an IX flag, um, which is a no brainer. So it's quite easy. You, you're actually getting something for your 40 Rand as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to put, put little prizes in that area. So under your seat, you'll be able to check to see if you've won any spot prizes. The Oprah effect, nice, nice. The Oprah effect, and um, they've got a. Uh, we've been told that they got the whole European feel. So we've got two big drums in that section mm-hmm. to try get a little chanting going. And yeah, I mean, uh, we're trying to create a vibe. And I really, I, I urge um, football supporters in this country, even if you're European for it, go. If you're in Cape Town, get down to the stadium. You know. Um, the PSL does have quality. Let me tell you that. Um, the yeah. people that keep on saying that football is rubbish in this country, um, just go and, and watch a few games and you'll see there are, there's plenty of talent. Well, it's so true. These guys are, after all, professionals. It's what they do. They're going to be good at what they do and it just needs the, like, the crowd to have more faith in that. I think you, know, you make the example of the 80s and how it came about. Of course, in the 80s, we didn't really have as much to do as we do now. You know, There's many distractions. And I think live sport has been the, the biggest sort of... Um, well, biggest thing to actually kind of, not what's the opposite of, like they've they've really just taken a back seat now because we've got all these other options that we to have our sporting disposal. So this initiative, actually, this whole one one six thing is amazing. Is this actually your idea, the pundits' initiative? Um, not really. We've actually got approached by um, Shoes, who's the marketing guy at IX. Um, ah, he's, okay. He came up with this um, idea, but it's basically he's brought us in with a few. Um, one or two other bloggers to try and get this idea out to the people. Yeah. I think that's been the biggest problem for the club. Um, there's been one or two good ideas that have come from the club. They just don't know how to get it out to the people. Sure. And I think that's where sort of our role comes in to try and get it out to as many football lovers, even guys who, you know, rugby fans. You know, we're trying to get any fan, you know, to really get behind the side um, and get behind Cape Town. I mean, at the end of the day, you would, we would love to have the effect where the castle ad, where you get um, mm. the football fans going to rugby, the rugby fans coming to the football, yeah. and even going to the cricket afterwards. Perfect world scenario, sure. Okay, um, so if you do want tickets, uh, I see you've got to contact Shoes, S H O Z at IX, Cape Town. Um, That's correct, you can yeah. open mail. Do you just want to run through as far as how we go about that? And whereabouts is the stadium, essentially? Okay, well, it's Cape Town Stadium. 
Oh, so, so it's actually at the Cape Town Stadium itself. They play all their home games. Oh, at the Cape Town brilliant! Stadium. Okay, that's so, always a good experience. Here we go. There's no excuse that it's too difficult to get in. It's not safe or whatever. So, it's a brilliant. Um, yeah, just if you want to get tickets, please just get in. Drop shoes an email. Tell him about um, you heard about the initiative and you're wanting to get your tickets. Um, I'm pretty sure on the day you'll be telling you to all meet in a certain area at the stadium, and you'll come out and you'll get your flags and your tickets and escort you to your block. Okay, well, Keegan, it's a fantastic initiative, and I think one that others, you know, I think the Lions could pick up on this. Anybody could pick up on this. Get the get, get the stadiums full and get the passion back. You know, for 40 rand, you know, you can't get any sort of value like that nowadays, and it's live sport, and you can really actually be part of the team, which is essentially what this initiative is about. Definitely, we want to build. You know, we want to build fans, and yeah. uh, we want the fans to sort of. Uh, experience something they've never experienced before and hopefully they bring their friends friends the next time. Cool. Well, Keegan, um, I've got to take two more callers in the next sort of 20 minutes. We have to chop it off there. Um, if you do want to read more about this fantastic initiative with IX, uh, IS Cape Town, go on to thepundits.co.za and of course you can chat to Keegan about it at Keegan Kruger um, on the Twitter. Um, he'll obviously be there for these matches so you can get to hang out with him, talk football and stuff like that. Whatever other footballers do, you can do that at the Ajax games going forward. Keegan, yep. just, just the last sort of word from you. Anything else you want to you just leave us with? Uh, oh, not really. I mean, it's back to it's basically World Cup qualifiers again mm -hmm. um, in the week. Um, yeah, we saw one or two shock results. Uh, Portugal drawing to Israel. I'm pretty sure you heard about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. England smashed San Marino 8-0. No. Um, yeah, I mean, Denmark walked all over Czech Republic. So, yeah, there were a few interesting results this week. Um, Tuesday, we're back on um, Tuesday or today, actually. Yeah, today and tomorrow, we actually got World Cup qualifiers again. England's got Montenegro. And there's a few other biggies. And then, yeah, in the weekend, we're back to, um, we're back to Premiership, back to European football. Okay, so football. action pack. So, basically, next Tuesday, I think we need to give you a bit more time because it sounds like a hell of a lot to get through. Yeah, there's, okay. a, there's a lot to go through. There's a lot to go through <laughs> for your Easter weekend. Cool, so follow uh, Keegan on uh, Twitter at Keegan Kruger, and you can catch him back next week. Keegan, thanks so much for your time again, and we'll catch you back same time next Tuesday. It's only a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Okay, and this one goes out to you, Keegan. Listen to Blogs on Balls. Back with Mornay from Rugger World after this. Welcome back to Blogs on Balls. That was Air with Sexy Boy. May have, may not have uh, dedicated that one to Keegan. There are some girls in the studio though, so don't uh, think elsewhere. Uh, we're going to take a call right now. Maz, if I can just get your help here. There seems to be David Bowery in the background of my... <laughs> yeah, um, holding the fort down by my, by my lonesome today without any other um, assistance is quite difficult. Um, so bear with me when I make a few faux pas here and there. We are currently trying to call Mornay from Rugger World. He is, well, pretty much my favorite rugby writer on the internet. Hello. Hello. Mone. Yeah, hello. Hey, Mone. Good, good to hear you, man. This is actually the first time I've ever spoken to you man to man. We always tweet and now here you are. <laughs> always true, always good. Thanks, man. How's it, man? Wow, you sound like a real adult as well. Unlike most people I chat to on Twitter. <laughs> I try and keep it. I try and keep it decent when I actually speak to people. Okay, just just a quick background on Mone. Mone um, has a fantastic rugby site called at Rugger World. Oh, sorry, RuggerWorld dot com. Now, if you're looking for a comprehensive rugby site, Mone pretty much covers it all. He, there are a few other talented writers on the site, which I really enjoy as well. So, if you're ever looking for fixtures, team sheets, uh, great sort of cutting edge articles, RuggerWorld.com is pretty much the place to go. And with the absence of Sean today, we are going to basically call upon Mone's expertise to chat about the weekend that was in Super Rugby. Now, Mone, we touched upon uh, Stephen Kitsoff getting a suspension a little bit earlier. We spoke about Curtly Beale and Kuba Vuna having a bit of an altercation. Let's uh, stick to the actual <laughs> rugby. Um, what were your sort of standout games from the weekend that just passed? Um, well, uh, the one stand-up game, not so much for the rugby being played, but uh, just for the achievement overall uh, was, was the Cheetahs win over the force over the weekend. Yet another win. Them, uh, three for <sighs> Sorry, Ben. Yeah, yeah, carry on saying, yet another win for the Cheetahs. <laughs> yeah, yet another win for the Cheetahs, you know, giving them three from four on tour, which is by far, obviously, the, the best result going on tour. And, you know, I think 
some people are suggesting a turning point for the union, and I'm just really happy for the boys. I'm really happy that pulling, they, they started to pull it together. And then winning games, we have become so used to them losing. So absolutely standout performance, obviously notwithstanding, you know, absolute annihilation. The Sharks pissed out on the Rebels, and obviously the Storm was just balanced point win in uh, since 2010, I think, I believe it was. 2011, 2010. Morning, I've got to say, that was one of the greatest experiences of my 2013. There were other factors at play, but that watching that Stormers game, Wow, that was quite something. I just want to quickly go back to the Cheetahs before we move on to the other games. I, I originally thought that the Cheetahs were looking a little bit tired against the Waratahs and then losing Houston was going to be like a really sort of, you know, could be their downfall. But there's just something so special about this team. You think it's more just, it's not just about the players, it's more about the sort of rugby culture they've got as far as being quite exciting and quite positive. Um, but it could be quite a lot of things, you know, and then there's been a lot of criticism leveled at Knocker, for instance, you know, uh, and then the team culture that exists with the teachers losing those games that we mentioned that they that they should have won or could have won. And, you know, I think a couple of things are involved here. One thing, the the, the, the fear of, of promotion relegation at the end of the Super Rugby season, I think plays a huge part. And I think, secondly, you know, guys on tour seems to, for some reasons, either pull together in, in what obviously was the case in the, with the Cheetahs, or completely fall apart, which is usually the case with the Aussies touring South Africa. <laughs> or the Bulls. Or <laughs> the Bulls falling off the bus, yeah, completely. Yeah, that's completely, a bit harsh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, you know, it was a special, special game by the Cheetahs. You know, you, I, I agree with you, they looked tired, you know, and I didn't give them much hope, especially given the, the force of magnificent victory over the Reds. They were so physical, they really went all out, and they were all over the Cheetahs for large parts of the game. Mm. But somehow the Cheetahs just kept themselves in there, you know, they just kept on believing, kept on believing in their structures, you know, which was, you know, I think kudos to Marco, you know, we, we give him sure. a lot of flack, but, you know, the coaching team really has put something nice together here, and Rian Smith stepping out in one horse and shoes, and he was one of the standout performers over the weekend for me, directing the traffic very well, controlling play, controlling the back line. Just an overall awesome, awesome performance and tour from the Cheetahs. Well, it is quite something because if the Cheetahs are strong, SA Rugby is in a really good place. Whether or not their sort of attacking style translates to Bok Rugby, which is, well, potentially a bit of a pipe dream, but it's just so good to see that it is, we know we are capable of it. I've always believed we have the players, we have the talent. It's just about believing it. And, you know, you saying about them sticking to their structures, it, it's not that hard. We can be a good team, um, a good playing nation as far as taking on the All Blacks or the Kiwi sides that are attacking play. Absolutely. You know, I made a comment um, in, in the review I did for the Cheetahs and saying they're, they're probably our most fearless team. So, yeah. you know, putting structure on the Cheetahs and one centers together, a lot of people might not agree. But, I mean, the structures of uh, referring to how they, you know, keeping on with the structure. I mean, they still give you heart attacks with what really did, you know, in his own 22, which resulted in a, in a false tie. Yeah. But uh, just how they keep their course, but leaving them with defensive structure specifically, which I think is a huge step up for the Cheetahs. And obviously, feeling of the forwards and the loses are currently absolutely magnificent I think you know by far the best loose trio combination in South Africa at the moment and I think every single um, Aussie or Kiwi commentator like crew is picking up on that you know they really are bringing so much to the game and again the, the depth that we have in these, play in these players um, these areas is just so so encouraging moving on to um, yeah, yeah. The, moving on to the Stormers you know they had probably when you look at it in context of, of what's happening the toughest possible starts and yet they're just getting better and better. Still kind of question marks over Elton Janchis. What's What do you make of his um, sort of entrance into the team so far? Yeah, yeah, the, absolutely the toughest part. You know, I mentioned uh, pre-season that, you know, the first five games for the Storms would be absolutely crucial, crucial, which now includes the game against the Crusaders coming up this weekend. Um, I might mention uh, over the weekend that I think, you know, the Yankees have finally arrived. You know, the, the first couple of games, is, you know, the Bulls was about, it was shocking. I guess the Sharks, he actually also never stepped up. And, you know, mm. the questions against the Chiefs even when he played. But, you know, I think he, he really played some mature rugby for the Stormers over the weekend. Yeah. I think um, some of his spotlights, one which actually saw Hio score uh, that brilliant try in the first half, he's, he's really taken control. I think he's settling in, you know, and, you know, we must remember the lad is going through, through more than just playing for a brand new union with new structures and new cultures. You know, the unfortunate loss of his blood earlier in the year, yeah, it's all affected by, you know, mentally. And, and I think mentally, he's settling down now. And, that's great news for South African rugby, not just the Stormers. You know, with Elton and through for the Sharks game, back to the McMillison game, we need these youngsters now to step up. And, and it seems like they're finally sitting and getting into the group now. Well, exactly. And just to, you know, sort of ignite the Stormers, I mean, that is a really good thing in itself because there were times where they were just untouchable in that Brumbies game. And this is against a Brumbies side that's been unbeaten. 
I'm pretty much made a mockery of all the people they've played against so far. Absolutely, you know, my criticism against the Stimmers were always really against, and specifically with the backline play, Ben West, that I felt that they lose momentum and they lose pace on attack with ball in hand uh, through the number nines and ten. You know, where in my mind, uh, you know, the, the old stalwarts for the Stimmers in the last couple of years, Stephen Ocha and Peter Grant, are very similar players. And we needed someone, you know, nothing against either one of the players, but because they play such a similar game, you know, the Stimmers just could not ever create momentum on the ball on the front foot. And with the Yankees and what, what we saw on the weekend, at, and I'm sure a lot of people would have picked this up, just with this distribution and, and the speed he puts on the ball going out to the rest of the backs, it gives the outside backs an extra meter or two of space. And, you know, guys like Theo can absolutely destroy you with just that much more space. Completely. I really hope he's not not going to miss out on Saturday. Gee, he took a big PK to the face there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He spent first hour in the game. Yeah, yeah, when it drops like that, you get a little <laughs> worried, huh? Um, <laughs> Highlanders lose again. That's another worry. I mean, I tipped them as playoff potential, but they haven't won a game yet, you know? <laughs> it's quite something. That, it's almost like they are the Blues of last year. Say, say again, man, I lost you there for a sec. What's the last one? I was just saying how crap the Highlanders are. You know, they were tipped for playoff potential, and uh, <laughs> they're essentially the Blues of last year. <laughs> they're just screwing up Super it's, Blues. It's, and it's amazing. <laughs> It's, it's amazing, you know. I mean, they make the most significant off-season buys for, for any of the New Zealand franchises, sure. you know. Uh, Jamie James has also been there for a couple of years now, so you can't really blame coaches' structures or, or, or culture. And, um, I, you know, personally, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a disappointment for me because I picked them as one of my favorites pre-season. But, I know, likewise. You know, something is just not, yeah, something is just not gelling there. You know, it's, it's quite amazing. You know, I think it's, once you get into a really bad run, it's, it's quite tough to get out of there. I think the, the Highlanders find themselves in that space now. But then again, you know, look what the Sharks did this weekend. It takes one good game when things just start falling into place. The senior players start, mm. you know, they stand up and then, and, and, you know, uh, depend or where everybody depends on the setup and let themselves be counted, it takes one good game. And I think, you know, don't write them off just yet. You're only about to throw the way into the into the tournament. They might still actually play a part come playoff times or, you know, nine people playoffs at the end of the uh, end of the season. Yeah, but so many losses here. But speaking of losses, uh, Waratahs finally won one. Now, does this sort of illustrate a false dawn with the Blues? You know, obviously they started the season so well at beating the Hurricanes and the Crusaders. But uh, losing to the Bulls and now um, losing to the Waratahs, that really is quite distressing for them. It is. Uh, from the Blues' perspective, you know, uh, I'm seeing uh, John Kerwin, or sorry, Sir John Kerwin, making quite a number of changes week in and week out. I'm not too sure that's the best thing to do. You know, I know it's, it's rotation, I know injuries play a part, but, um, you know, if you change combinations all, all the way along, you know, it's, it's tough for the guys, again, to, to find a group to settle into. Um, that, that might play a part. False dawn, you know, possibly, but the guys have showed against the, well, you know, some of the better teams in the competition that they can really play some good football or some good rugby. Oh, you know, so, Mona, Mona, um, please, don't use the F word. <laughs> I know, sorry, dude. <laughs> I remember when I said it. Um, yeah, you know, they, they, prove, they prove they can get play good rugby. You know, I, I don't think it's a false dawn. I, I think the Blues are extremely dangerous and probably one of the most dangerous teams in the competition, they slipped up against the World Tours and, you know, that's a team you really don't want to lose against because it's because they cut. Well, geez, especially there, no, with nobody watching them in Sydney. <laughs> yeah, so all in all, it was a good weekend. Yeah. Um, personally, I got five out of seven on Super Brew, which is a big improvement. Do you, do you also find that when you, yeah. when, you, when you give tips and they don't quite come right, people on Twitter have a good go at you? Absolutely. It's like we, we look into a crystal ball type of thing, you know. You <laughs> should know look, better. I mean, tips is, is one of those. And then this year has been extraordinary. I mean, three out of four wins for the Cheetahs on tour. I mean, hello, let's be honest. The island is not stood by us as, as favourite, but tipped by the New Zealand uh, media as, as one so of the favourites. Everyone, yeah. Not winning a game yet, you know. It's, it's an absolute dog show at the moment with, with, uh, with tipping this competition. And we all just try and look at, you know, the team sheets, uh, you know, momentum carried over from the last game. Injury-wise, what's going on, you know, where they're playing sort of conditions. But it's difficult, you know. But I reckon if you get the 60, 66% type of tipping rate, you, you're doing pretty well in this competition. <laughs> well, exactly. Um, well, I'm going to have to cut it off there. We uh, need to get on to our Australian cricket consult, uh, correspondent quite shortly. But thanks so much for your time this morning. I know you just pulled off from the side of the road, such as your commitment to joining us today. Um, no, where, for our listeners to read and obviously enjoy your, your rugby insights going forward, where can they find you? 
Uh, look, I talked about this league, just follow Rugby World. Um, they can get all the details on the site as well. You mentioned that. Thanks for that. Uh, RugbyWorld.com. It's, it's um, R-U-G-G-A. Uh, let's say again, Ben. R-U-G-G-A World. Just in case people try to spell it. World, yeah. Uh-huh. Dot com. Um, yeah, fun of me. You know, I try to reply and speak to all the guys if they tweet me. You know, so, you know, if I ignore you, I'm either busy or not sitting at my computer like I am now. Mm. Um, but just one last thing. I know you need to go, but what a great game of Varsity Cup last night, Medibas and Maltese. All right, uh, yeah. And, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, just completely blew you out of the water. I think the Medibas won the hell of a game last night. Probably the ref calls not going for them. Uh, I made a comment last night, and obviously for the listeners as well, and for yourself, maybe to discuss it sometime. I made a comment, and I was asking, have we finally awoken the Eastern Cape rugby beast in 2013? Something about it. Well, I was thinking the exact same thing yesterday. If they've got a good varsity culture, then surely, you know, they're on a good road yep. there. Together with the Kings being whatever Soru is going to use them for, because let's be honest, they're actually making them puppets right now. But it is, and I, I personally, as much as I, I would like the Lions in the mix, just knowing that Eastern Cape Rugby is on the up, it's a really good thing for all of us. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, for me, there's never one in, in place of the other. You know, I think this place for everyone is, I think, a lot of just sort of structures up. But, but I think, you know, we cannot ignore the, the talent and, and, and the possibilities that could come from Eastern Cape Rugby. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah, it really was. Well, Moni, thanks so much. We're definitely going to have you on the show again. You're an absolute pleasure to talk to. And, of course, keep up the good work on com. It is still my first place, first call of rugby. Um, Generally, when I don't know what I'm talking about, I go to you and you sh- you put me on the right path. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Always a pleasure, mate. Cool, man. We'll catch you back soon. Um, oh, 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 oh. Wow. Pharrell just jumped in there. Uh-huh. Keep listening. Aussie Cricket coming up next. Right here on Blogs on Ball. Snoop Dogg and Pharrell, beautiful right here on Blogs on Balls. Wow, this show is flying today. First hour holding the ship by myself, um, looking about as comfortable as Phil Hughes in the crease at the moment. Probably a good time to bring in our Aussie, Dennis Friedman. How are you doing? How's it? Brilliant. Look at you already with the lingo and how's it? Dennis, Am so I saying it well? You, you, you nailed it. That was it. Right out of the screws <laughs> first up. Good work. Dennis, um, I've really looked looking forward to. I've been looking forward to really chatting to you. Um, obviously, we're going to bring you in for cricket, which is a big, big game for you Australians, despite the score lines of your recent test. Um, <laughs> yeah, just I, I don't know how to intro you. Actually, how about you take us away? Yeah, I, I, let's just say I'm uh, the faceless man behind uh, <laughs> behind many of the things that are going on in in the Twitter sphere. <laughs> that is quite the intro. So, um, Dennis, whereabouts in Australia are you? I'm in Melbourne. You're in Melbourne. I'm in Melbourne, Ben, and uh, quite enjoying it. It's nice weather down here today, enjoying the sunshine. Apparently, Melbourne's like the nicest place to, to live in, in Australia, I, I, from, what um, I, from what I gather, and the girls are generally prettier than the ones in Sydney. I've seen photos of you on Twitter, mate, and uh, I would suggest that maybe uh, where you live might have the prettier <laughs> girls, but uh, it's not too bad down here. <laughs> Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Well, enough about um, the sideshows. I've got a whole yes. bunch of stats in front of me about the series. You've written an article um, of, of recently. Um, of course, you do a lot of things in, in cricket on the, on the Twitter sphere and stuff. Um, just yeah, Let's just kick off your thoughts as yeah. far as India putting, putting your boys over the barrel to the tune of 4-0. Firstly, you uh, obviously didn't see this coming. And secondly, what was the sort of big thing that made this happen? Yeah, look, I guess I'm watching cricket from a neutral perspective. Let's park my uh, my Australian loyalties. I, I think it was a fantastic series for Test cricket. I think we had four results in four Test matches. And if you just look at what happened at New Zealand, England today, you know, it, it came down to the last ball in another series and there was a nil-all draw. Yeah. Um, I think Australia underprepared and tried to tinker with something that didn't need tinkering. So if you look back at their preparation... They had three tests against you guys, and then they had three tests against Sri Lanka. Uh-huh. And if it wasn't and if it wasn't for FAF uh, in in Adelaide, Australia would have been the number one test team flying into the Sri Lankan series. That is a very which good point. They then won yeah, and it wasn't um, for FAF as well um, in in Perth. They were also screwed in that first day. When you remember. 
Yeah, so look, I, I think everything heads back to that South African series. If you remember, um, John Inverarity, the Australian uh, head selector, and, and your guy, Mickey Arthurs, I don't know how we, how we uh, left the door open and let him in, but uh, <laughs> we, had, uh, we, we, we had this ridiculous scenario where you have uh, an unsettled team, you have this rotation policy rolled out, you have um, Phil Hughes protected from, the, from Dale Stain by Rob Quiney. Um, what, what kind of messages are we sending to the world if we're going to be the number one team that we're scared to put people up to the best? And, uh, and then we went into South, the, uh, the Sri Lankan series and we rotated a bit again. You know, uh, Jackson Bird came in for the Hobart test. and, and um, Yeah, he didn't, sound like, he didn't start- sound like a real person. He sound- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so that all went well, and, and, and Australia's thinking, yeah, we'll go to India and we'll rip them apart like last time, and uh, we end up there, and, and then you look at the squad, the 16 people picked, and and you, you, suddenly Xavier Doty appears from nowhere, who the hell is Glenn Maxwell, um, Steve Smith <laughs> turns up. Uh, well, I'm, gl- I, I I'm glad you're saying, on. I'm glad you're saying like, who the hell is Glenn Maxwell, because I'm looking at these things as well, saying I'd love to comment on these guys, but I'll be literally be putting things out of my ass trying to talk about them. Well, mate, let me tell you about Glenn Maxwell's uh, <laughs> tour. So Les Parkey's one million dollar batting, uh, but this this is the uh, cricket believe it or not stat. He actually had the best strike rate of all the Australian bowlers through the series of thirty five, and it was actually the best strike rate of any bowler in the series. He did. Um, that is correct. Probably, I, I can I can back that up by saying he bowled forty one overs and took seven for one nine three. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. But I mean, I'm, I've just made some notes here, mate. I, 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 there's just strange stuff that happens. So this, you know, homework gate. We, we haven't talked about homework gate. So here we have a scenario where the coach is saying, for the last year, I haven't been able to manage the culture properly with the captain. So you guys didn't fill in a form. Four guys can go home and piss off. Yeah. Um, now one of them is the vice captain. He goes home. Um, you know. I guess on a good good news story to see the birth of his first child. No one begrudges that. Yeah, it's fine. But he's but he's but he's landed back in uh, Australia and he's had a nice sook about it. Um, he's had a whinge about it in front of the media. He's publicly taken Clark on. He's taking uh, Mickey on, and then and then all of a sudden Clark gets injured. Oh shit! Let's fly. Can I say that word? I yeah, can say that word. Go for it. Um, just don't fantastic. say fantastic. Just okay. don't say homo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we, we, we send him back and make him captain after we've just sent him away for not uh, being part of a leadership group and setting the culture that we want. So I think that's all bizarre. And he averaged 18, so he did nothing. And, uh, you know, he, he was out there um, politicking for Cowan's role as an opener as well. We forget that. So this is a disruptive influence who, who has no further place in the Australian team, as I'm concerned. Um, we had the f- stupid situation where Nathan Lyon was starting to find some form and we drop him for the third test and we bring Doherty in and Maxwell in. But that did Lyon a world back. of good, though. <laughs> uh, well, he comes back and takes seven for. Now, if I take you back a few years, the last time Australia toured India, a guy on debut by the name of um, Jason Crazier took 12 wickets in his first test match against India <laughs> as an off-spinner. We, fly, we then fly to Perth for the first test and I think it might have been against Dew Boys. Uh-huh. Uh, he takes Nunfa in Perth, which is the worst uh, spinner's wicket in the world, and so we get rid of him. Um, the, the Australian selection policies are rooted. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah. Can I say rooted? Carry okay, on. fantastic. Just what H- else have I got in here? It's I've just got- the H word, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it's oh, look, just, yeah, this is yeah, why yeah. I really wanted to get you on here, because the insights of an Australian cricketer, or a cricket, cricket fan, because obviously over here, we sort of instinctively hate you guys and we call you lots of names and things like that and obviously we refer to things involving sheep but yeah, it's just gra- New Zealanders yes well that's what Australians always say I've been to New Zealand <laughs> trust me it's it's I don't know I didn't see many sheep well I did actually see one I've been to I've been to South Africa I've seen what you guys do too so <laughs> <laughs> but you wow. know, we, we we come back and now we we've got an Ashes series coming up, Ben. And, and if I look at the batting lineup, let's start there. I've got uh, no one in the team averaging over forty except for Michael Clark. So you know, we're starting to compare our batting lineup with Bangladesh and Zimbabwe and, and these, I was these wonderful the same nations thing. like that. You know, I was thinking the same thing. I, I was thinking that Elvira Peterson could basically come become an Aussie and he would be a Test cert for the Ashes. <laughs> <laughs> Article well, we, written we about need- him. <laughs> We need some crazy South African names like Elviro. I mean, we've got we've got some in the rugby team with Beric. I mean, what's a Beric? Um, anyhow, um, what else went on during here? Yeah, strange, bizarre stuff was going on. Dean Jones, 
I don't know if you read his article about the BCCI through this series. He um, came out and suggested that uh, the BCCI is the greatest thing for cricket because they run the IPL and have all this power. So yes, there was we, we, actually, we featured that article on the show, I think, about three weeks ago. Um, it yeah. was, I, I know that on Armchair Selector there was quite a, um, quite a bit of talk around that. He's a plonker on Twitter, isn't he? <laughs> Uh, he, he's just a plonker. He's just full stop. Forget about Twitter. Just just put him anywhere. He he fits the bill. Um, uh, look, there's some good stuff though. I mean, you had uh, if I look at the Indian side of things. I know there's a few Indians in South Africa who might be listening. I hope mm-hmm. um, you had you had uh, Darwin come out of nowhere. Cyclone Tracy, as we call him here in Australia, and uh, he made uh, made a double hundred on debut and just basically shut the door on Sawag for life, which is probably good for cricket. I think so too. Um, you had Murali VJ, you know, average 40, uh, 61 through, uh, through, through the series. And mm-hmm. The kids only played 16 test matches. So there's some exciting stuff here for India. Um, you had, now, if you look at the downside uh, on the batting, you had Sashin. Uh, A lowly uh, average of 32, made, which is actually an improvement uh, on his current form, really. Uh, well, he averaged 32, and the ironic thing is his last dismissal was a dodgy LBW, and he's the guy blocking the DRS. So, you know, the karma train comes around, Sashin, if you're listening. But but what's even more impressive is that he averaged one less than, than Ed Cowan, so I think that just summarizes his series. Um, That's actually, it's, so, uh, it's so true, because even, even Smash and Grab, uh, Warner had a better series than he did. Yeah, and look, and there's an interesting discussion itself. I'm I'm a... Uh, as you know, mate, I'm, I think T20 is is the uh, is the worst thing to hit the cricket world for a long, long time, and and, yes. and Warner is the epitome of that. Here we have a guy who, in his first T20 match for Australia, comes out and knocks 76 off probably four balls or something. He might have been facing him around here. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> but uh, on the basis of that, he's in the one day team, and then on the basis of the, that, he's in the Test team. And, he, yeah, and exactly. you know, unlucky for unlucky for us, he made a quick hundred, and he hasn't he hasn't made a hundred since the first Test in Brisbane against South Africa. Yeah. And all and but he's still in the team. I don't understand it. The guy, you know, I compare him to someone like Cook or someone that can hang around. Um, you know, even Ed Cowan's not making the runs, but he at least will face 150 balls he's and, got a bit and of take fight, the shine yeah. off it. Well exactly. I mean if you're if you're going through an absolute sort of dog shit run of form, as an opener yeah. taking the shine off the ball is one of your sort of um well job requirements really but it's funny you yeah. said about t20 and i still think it's the syphilis of cricket really it's all good <laughs> it's all good fun in the beginning but it leaves a terrible mark and it, i mean it can end careers and it's if you, like sleeping with your sister exactly <laughs> wow that's something else in comp- <laughs> <laughs> as i said i've been to south africa i've seen what happens okay so we'll, we'll look I mean, <laughs> next time you come here stay away from the deep south <laughs> <laughs> No, I love the deep south. Hey, listen, I'll tell you, Ben, something else I found interesting, and, and, um, and this is where Cricket Australia has got to pull its head in. They took 16 people on that tour. Mm-hmm. They played 17, and one of the original 16 didn't get a Guernsey, and Kawaja meant to be the next great hope. He was the, he was the next punting uh, yeah, to a certain so, degree a while ago. <laughs> well, Steve, you know, Steve Smith was the next Shane Warne, too, so... <laughs> <laughs> Although I think he's, I think he's more like Steve Waugh than Shane Warner. Actually, there's a lot of similarities in their career. I think uh, you follow the the great one at Richie Benno underscore, and I think you wrote an interesting article about that. Yeah, I uh, well, we generally always push at Richie Benno underscore quite a lot in the show because I think everyone needs a mentor, and I think Rich, <laughs> Richie is the mentor for all of us who enjoy the, the game of cricket. And I think um, I speak on behalf of everybody who loves the the great game when I say that. But I'll now, pass on my best wishes to him on your behalf. I believe he's in Melbourne somewhere at the moment, but. Um, well, so he's, I, I, he's obviously sunning himself for the next test series. How, how does he maintain so, that, that tan? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you look forward. India's got uh, the champ. I guess the Champions Trophy is the next big thing. India don't actually play another test match for nearly 12 months. So I don't know how Sashin's going to last uh, that long. But if I look at the Australian um, way forward, they've got uh, the Champions Trophy and then they've got the Ashes. Now, before the Ashes come about, England have a couple of home test matches against New Zealand. Mm. You know, and that, that, that I'm predicting that's going to end up five draws in a row. You know, the three, <laughs> the three that happened in New Zealand and two there. But uh, <laughs> Australia's not well prepared. They're going to go in to the Ashes with an unsettled team, mm-hmm. a culture that, that's rooted, um, a coach who's trying to stamp his authority on something South African style. I don't know. He needs to cook up a good braai and get some 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 beers flowing or something. You know, I, I don't know what he needs to do there. Well, um, put it this way: when Kepler Vessels refers to you as a, <laughs> as a bit of a prick, I think you that's it. <laughs> he, he should be sniffing around for an IPL assistant manager, bowling coach slash fielding drill assistant, because uh, he's screwed if he even makes ashes at, at this rate. 
We refer to him as our Kepler, if you don't mind. But uh, <laughs> um, I'm looking. I'm looking at you know what would be the best team. What does Australia need to take to England? Looking at the conditions, you know, if we try and keep it semi-serious, and mm. some guys have to go. I think Watson needs to go. I think he. Uh, He's he's the dag hair on the sheep's ass. He he just hangs yeah. around and has a rotten smell, and you can't get rid of him, and he's not achieving much. And uh, I think he, his time is gone. He's a wonderful one day player, and he's you know he's the world's best T20 player. Some people are trying to tell me, but uh, he's not a test player. That's great. That's like saying he's the world's best ping pong ball executioner over a wall in windy conditions. It, it's so on, trivial on, to me. On PlayStation, yeah. <laughs> on PlayStation on a Tuesday. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I think Warner, I think a hard decision needs to be made on Warner. Yes, he yep. can probably win you a match, but he. I looked at his century strike rate, and he makes a hundred every five matches, and that's not going to. If he only makes one hundred during the first five tests in England, the game's over. Exactly. You know, Ashes Ashes series are one on on massive opening partnerships. You go mm. back to the Slater and Taylors making three twenty nine in a day at Trent Bridge and, and so forth. This that's is that's demoralising. Yeah, it's demoralising. Yeah, he, 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 but once once in a series ain't going to do it. I think uh, I think Wade um, unfortunately needs to go. You know, I, I call this guy. You can't break this guy. He's the Toyota Toyo, the Toyota Hilux of the Australian cricket team. He survived cancer. He survived a broken jaw. He's played with a broken finger. But unfortunately, he can't bloody catch. So, <laughs> Terrible yeah. element for a keeper, that. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it's part of the job description. So I think uh, Tim Payne has just finished the Shield final. He batted okay, and, he, and he's keeping like a champion. And I think he's... He's he's ready to come back, and uh, I think we need some blood that hasn't been tainted by this uh, Indian experience. And I th- unfortunately, I think Peter Siddle might miss out as well. Um, in my mind, right? Has he got a, I, has he got I a Buddhist retreat you know, on or the something? Guy's, the guy's full of heart. You no, know, no one can down a bowl of tofu like this bloke. But uh, <laughs> un- unfortunately, he's he's a straight up and down kind of bowler. Uh-huh. And uh, in England, you need to be able to seam it or swing it like Jimmy Anderson or Philander or these guys, or have express pace like a stain. And he doesn't have any of that. So I, I, I can see some changes there. So I see Jackson Bird coming in for him. Uh, Jackson Bird to me reminds me of a Terry Alderman of the eighties. He, he's not express, but geez, he can he can jag that ball around yeah. and. Um, and he just puts it in the right spot, and he's going to be a dangerous, uh, dangerous kid if he gets but a run. I just want to stop you there and, and just back up Siddle here, not because I like him or anything. There's a special yeah. chant he has at most grounds in, in, um, in South Africa that start with a W. But don't you think that the, the <laughs> Richard Hadley style? <laughs> don't you think one of the biggest things that's missing from the Aussie culture right now is just that brash bastard in your face kind of thing? Like I'm sure you saw that that strange video from some Taiwanese gent who who made this whole thing about yes. that was brilliant. But like they, they start off by saying, I mean, there's there's three guys driving one of those big trucks to the outback and just driving over things. Don't you think that the Aussie team is just missing that kind of in your face? Like I've had your mother yeah, sort of but yeah. It's not Siddle. The guy eats tofu and lettuce leaves. How can you put him up as your as as your solo have, man? You have know, you seen his face? <laughs> He's not the guy. We don't have a David Boone or a Merv Hughes or a. It's been knocked out. It's been knocked out of the culture of the Australian cricket team. You yeah. know, it's it's full of Julios now, as they call themselves. Guys that want to look in the mirror. Look at bloody. Look at Mitch Johnson, Zoolander. The, you know, and and he's got the, he's got. The, you would you could put him in that movie or put Zoolander in the Australian cricket team. It's the same expression. It's the same bloody personality. They're just as both as dumb as each other. Um, so we just think we could get rid of the Julios then. That's a great insight. Yeah, get, rid, get rid of the Julios. And I don't know what's left. Well, maybe oh, maybe know. you got to dick that... Oh, sorry, not dick. Dig um, that, that Mick Lewis out of retirement again. <laughs> Mick Lewis needs to get out of retirement. Buff Lehman needs to become the coach. Fatty, <laughs> co- uh, you know, Cosgrove needs to come into the team. We need some fat bastards who can sit exactly. at short leg and, you know, rough catch ones. in their gut. You need those, those rough ones that fart at short leg and say things under their breath <sighs> and stuff. That's what you And you, you look at... And you go back through go back through the last twenty years of the good fat bastards, the Ranatungas and the and, and um, you know the Salim Maliks and the guys that got under your skin, the Inzamanal Hucks. This is what Australia yeah. is lacking. Get get us these fat bastards back. You know, get rid of the biggest loser and, and get on the biggest KFC eater. That's what we need. <laughs> well, that is definitely for the, the new search for that big bash. Just find those fat <laughs> bastards in the stage. I remember when. Um, I think it was the twelfth man. Uh, there was the final CD uh, when when yeah. Billy Birmingham does all the voices for all the people. England was so England was so screwed that they got Tony Gregg to come in and play, 
and then th- they got some guy out of, out of the crowd. <laughs> But this is exactly what we're talking about. He goes on there with a, with a, with a beer in his hand. He decks Glenn McGrath, hits two sixes, and gets bowled. The Aussies need that, that sort of... <laughs> isn't that what we just did with Glenn Maxwell? We just pulled a guy out of the crowd? I don't know. Again, I don't know but too I, much about him. Uh, oh. I just, I just, this strange stuff. I, I, I go back into the 90s, right, when Australia, in the early 2000s, Australia was a powerhouse. And, and yeah. I look at the bench strength. Guys that couldn't get a game, right? Yeah. Brad Hodge, Jamie Siddons, Stuart Law... Um, I, I, I can keep on. I can keep going on. There's, there was hundreds and thousands of these guys just piling on the runs. You, you forget that Mr. Cricket, Mike Hussey, had to make 10,000 first class runs in the Shield before he started playing Test cricket at 30. I know. He was like a, cricket, um, he was like a cricketing fluffer. He was there and thereabouts, but he wasn't really <laughs> getting game time. <laughs> oh, he went harder than Ron after a dry spell. Exactly right. He. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, but that's what you had. And now if I look into Shield Cricket, Ricky Ponting just won Shield Cricketer of the Year after only playing half the season. That's just um, crazy. Australia is, Australian Shield competition used to be the strongest competition. Everyone used to want to come here and play. Viv Richards played in this competition. You mm. know. Um, now, it's, now it's a laughing stock. And, and it's a laughing stock because I'll go to play county cricket, I'll make money, or I'll go play T20 because there's no point me making runs in Shield because I can't get a game. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's some. There's just massive structural issues in this part of the world, and you know, let's let's talk about India. I think it's much better. They've got a they've got a communistic BCCI. They've got two billion people to pull uh, cricket talent from. If one doesn't work, throw them out and get another one. It doesn't really matter. They're all called VJ or Rahul or something, so no one even knows that they've changed the name. Um, <laughs> And they got more money than you can poke a stick at. I mean, I saw a tweet today from the I, from the ICC, right? And it said, "Congratulations to South Africa, finished top of the uh, test table for the 2012. Your prize money, four hundred thousand dollars." It's a mere snip. <laughs> BCCI, you're the forty six thousandth best cricketer. You're making four hundred thousand dollars, and you're probably playing the Bangladeshi <laughs> Premier League. You know, it's <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> Well, Dennis, I I, I could literally chat to you, I think, for the rest of the day. Um, We're definitely going to bring you back. Uh, We've got Sport Billy, at at Sport Billy says from Twitter, he's um, having a little discussion after Hoppus 11. So basically, just to kind of, um, we are going to podcast this entire show. I think basically, um, stop being so nice, maybe stop being so vegetarian. And that's the only chance of even, what, holding a sword in the ashes. Uh, look, our, our captain did underwear ads, you know, so <laughs> we're, we're in trouble. When, when your captain gets up and does Bond's underwear ads on television, standing there in his, in his jocks, and, and your main fast bowler's eating carrot sticks for lunch, <laughs> you've got a problem. Okay, Dennis, uh, where can the listeners find you? Um, you, you do write a bit. Um, you've got a fledgling Twitter profile. Uh, this is obviously Yes, I've only, I only just this. started that so I could hook up with you today. Nice. Um, I, I, so let me just say I hide on Twitter under different various names. But if you um, if you if you really want to see my work, I would suggest that you go um, and read the ArmchairSelected.com, which is the greatest website for amateur amateur writers uh, on all sports, including your favourite rugby union. Oh. I still haven't worked out what a Brumby is or. A, oh, or great! A, we we can actually bring you in and talk rugby in future because well, Aussie rugby is really terrible. It's boring. It's shit. You'll pick it up in a week and you'll be an absolute pundit. <laughs> I don't know much about it. I know that you have like hookers and, and you have a touch judge that works out who touched the ball or something with the hookers. I don't know how it You're all works, but there. it sounds great. You're halfway yeah. there, basically. That's um, all it needs to know, really. So to answer your question, um, please follow the Armchair Selector on Twitter and read our articles. There's some fantastic stuff there. And get around some of the great cricket uh, um, profiles on Twitter, such as the Cricket Geek. Um, we've talked about Richie Benno underscore. Mm. Um, Obviously, Sports Billy, he's one of my favorites now. I've he's only great. recently found yeah. him through your show. but uh, And Old Cricket is one of your favorites as well, I believe, right? He, yeah, he also very, very... Like, this is what I love about this whole thing. This is why we started the show, because there are so many great guys that aren't in the mainstream, but their their insights are just amazing. The, the knowledge and the ability to actually just poke, poke fun and pull the piss in the right sort of way. And I think that's just so lacking in mainstream TV and broadcasting. Yeah, well, you, uh, you know, old cricket, this guy is a, a guy training to be a doctor. He wants to do vasectomies. I don't know who trains for seven years to play with guys nuts, but that's him. That's that's the kind of guy you want to follow on Twitter, right? Completely. <laughs> and he's doing, he's doing it in the Czech Republic. That's where you really know how to do them. Yeah, no, he's in England. Oh, the Czech Republic, I think, is Pavilion Opinions. There's another one. No, no, he, um, he was there. That's how you met James from Pavilion Opinions. Oh, right. the, the two of them okay. are in Czech Republic getting drunk, drinking vodka with lots of good-looking girls. <laughs> 
and uh, learning <laughs> hey, how to do vasectomies. <laughs> hey, there's one more guy I want to plug on a serious note. It's an 18-year-old uh, cricket writer, and his handle is F, w- F Wild uh, Cricket. Freddie Wild, uh-huh. the kid's 18, and he writes like he, he's been uh, working at Wis- Wisden for all 200 years of that uh, thing's existence. Follow F Wild Cricket if you really want to read some uh, some clever cricket articles rather than the stupid stuff that I'd normally put out. Yeah, okay. Dance, I'm going to cut you off right there. We're going to play a song to kind of go out of this, but thank you so much for your time today. Um, can't wait to have you back on the show. And, um, Good just, on you, Ben. Looking just forward judging to from the smiles in the studio here from Dizzy and Simon and Maz. Uh, definitely a, an early favorite. Simon's actually doing things with his mouth, which is probably not appropriate. But I'm going to take those and that he likes you. Um, yes, Daisy's smiling. Yeah. Beauty. Beauty. <laughs> All right, Dennis, catch you back soon, buddy. Bye. Thanks so much. We've got Sport Billy says still coming up here on Blogs on Balls. We go into our final half hour. We've got a sport discussion about bonus points in rugby. Stereo MCs were connected. A very, very connected show today. We've had a rugby expert come in, Morning from Rugger World. We've had Keegan from the Pundits talking football. And then our new favourite, Dennis Friedman from Melbourne, Australia, talking Ashes Cricket, as well as the Indian series, which has left the Aussies a little bit red faced. Another expert of uh, the show, Sport Billy says, Can you hear us? Yeah, I've got you loud and clear. Ben, how's my connection? Uh, if your connection's good. Your connection's very good. Nice good play stuff. on the song there. I see you becoming a pro at this. <laughs> now, we were worried that your uh, CCOM cable, or whatever that thing is, was uh, sort of cable thefted overnight, but your connection's pretty good. And my cable's in good standing. Very, very good. You listen to uh, Dennis now on the show. Yeah, no, no, it's just, I'm still chuckling. Yeah. Uh, what a fun, huh? Special individual. Uh, we are, as you can tell, running hugely late. I just thought we'd go with that. Um, I know we normally try to give people 10 minutes, but he got about 30. Uh, so we've got 25 minutes left in the show, uh, which we should go swiftly along for your sport, Willy of the Week. Who has yeah. caught, who's caught your eye this week? Yeah, there's definitely been a couple. I've been... Uh, I've been out of uh, out of action last week. I was up in the bush, and so I missed a lot. But these guys, um, I didn't have to look far to find three candidates. And uh, the first one is you've mentioned is Jerry Collins. Uh, just a couple <laughs> of questions questions around what he was doing. Why was he running into a department store to hide from a gang? Um, I mean, surely there are better places to hide. Um, the second thing was why was he armed with a bread knife? Um, I believe the blade was was fairly long, but I mean, you know, come on, Jerry. You got, if you're going to be armed, you know, rather pack some heat or something. Well, exactly. <laughs> and uh, especially coming from New Zealand, I mean, this is what these guys we've all watched once were warriors. Yeah. And uh, we would have expected more from Jerry. Um, <laughs> third thing was a Brazilian gang. I mean, why is it being chased <laughs> by a Brazilian gang? I know. So you can't <laughs> actually make it up. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's something straight out of uh, straight out of the Comedy Channel. Um, and and why don't Brazilian gangs like rugby players? I mean, that was one of the quotes I read that, you know, Brazilian gangs and uh, wherever he was have it in for rugby players. So um, there's something more more to that story, I think. Well, and, exactly. Um, there isn't exactly a history of, of rugby in Brazil, let alone so much so that there's hatred for, for foreign players. Yeah, the only thing I could think of, you know, thinking of Jerry Collins and what he's been up to in the past is that perhaps somewhere in a far-off land, Jerry Collins might have pissed on a Brazilian soccer field. <laughs> Because um, we, we all know what he did before the betters low that one year. Um, so anyway, so that's Jerry Collins. He, yep. He's my first nominee. Um, then we've got uh, we've got Kurtley Bill. Oh, uh, he repeat also offender. mentioned and yeah. definitely uh, an upstanding willy of the week. I, I would say. Um, the first question I have there is: He sat out the game against the Sharks with a hand injury, mm-hmm. but then the hand was quite all right when he had to. Uh, Beat his teammate in the in, in the school bus, yeah. Um, so I mean, what what was he doing? And and also the other question, which is more about Cooper Vuna, was why was he trying to help Kirtley Bill in the first place? I mean, Kirtley's not the sort of guy that I would help, but um, you know, he, he's got quite a track record in these uh, drinking escapades, and um, 
yeah, good luck to him with the future of his career because I think this is going to be, we're going to see him in the dark time and time again. Well, um, completely. And I, I did suggest over Twitter yesterday there could be a, a bit of a love triangle here considering that Kurtley, Quaid and James are, are real tight. But then Cooper Vuna was rooming with James this last week. I saw this. I there's, saw this. this. There's something in there, I think. I already do. No, I, I mean, thank you for pointing that out because this is most concerning to the to the triangle. And I would think, you know, if we dig deeper here, no wonder the ARU are being so cagey about it. Yeah, um, I, I agree. You know, who cares about the drug scandal in Australian sport? Uh, Jeez, the love all, triangle. We've all be, forgotten yeah. that about quite quickly, isn't it? <laughs> so are, and, those, are those your two nominees or do you have another one? I've got one more and that's just TMOs in general, but oh, brought yeah. to the fore by the, by the performance of the TMO and the Bulls versus uh, Reds game. Um, who backed up the call for a yellow card for Lionel Mopu, where, I mean, how can you give a, a winger a yellow card for dumping a prop? I mean, th that should be written into the rules. It can't happen. I mean, Slipper basically, you know, tried to do something like, like he was trying to jump over a horse or something. Um, <laughs> it, it was sort of unelegant uh, backflip or, or something that he performed, or front flip, I guess. But, mm. um, yeah, I mean, the TMOs this season, Ben, as you know, yeah, I've got a terrible, special yeah. place in my, in my hate for the TMOs. And uh, I, I think hell, if you go to hell, you probably find these guys um, all hot, you know, crouched over in front of their TV screens making calls. Um, but, yeah, I think just TMOs in general would be another nominee. But I think the, the sort of um, the forerunner to how terrible these guys are is because the refs now wear pink in New Zealand and they're now stars of the show. And I think it's a, it's a knock-on effect. We've got to silence these refs from just making anything but the calls. And I think the TMOs will then stop trying to aspire to be them. Because it, they're cocking in this up, everyone. Absolutely. And, and we all know TMOs is like the graveyard for refs. You know, Completely. You're not good enough to be on the field anymore. anymore. Let's put you in the box and give you more power. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Jerry Collins, you think that's going to be the one? Or do you want to go with Kirtley? Because, um, again, it's a toss of the coin. Yeah, yeah I think I'm going to go with Kirtley. I mean, Jerry, I've still, got, I've still got some respect for what he did to Sebastian Chabal. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go with Kirtley. Okay, so Kirtley Bill is Sport Willie of the Week. Oh, Icon of the Week, well, it's a very short list. It's Tiger Woods and Tiger Woods. Um, you know, I'm putting my prejudice aside here. I've never liked the guy too much, but you, you can't you can't discredit what he's done. From 58th in the world, sort of, you know, in a place where the whole world was basically just pulling the piss out of your you know, extramarital affairs, the guy's come back to be world number one, playing incredibly well, and uh, 77 titles. I mean, that's something that even Gary Player could really look at and go, that's a good effort. Yeah, I, be, I believe he is using a stiff shaft. A very stiff shaft. Billy, we're going to take a quick little song and we're going to come back. Our discussion this week is, should we implement an extra bonus point? There's a lot of talk over the weekend after the Sharks thrashed the Rebels. And of course, the Crusaders had it all their own way against the, the Kings. But should they be incentivized to keep scoring tries? We currently have a bonus point system for four tries. Should there be one in place for... Four, six, sorry, six tries or eight tries. We'll find out after this from Stardust. Music sounds better with me. Sport Billy. Music sounds better with you, Stardust, here on Balls Visual Radio. Just for you, Simon. Linking hard today on a Tuesday. We're into the last two, few minutes of the show. We got Sport Billy says with me as usual for our discussion. Unfortunately, the discussion has been very limited today. Billy, um, yeah, we talked about earlier in the week about the extra bonus point. What's your take on that? Yeah, I certainly think it's an idea worth uh, worth looking at, and and I would hope that they do because, you know, the general thing is we see teams once they you know once they start giving a team a proper hiding, they tend yeah. to take the foot off the pedal a bit. Um, once they've got the bonus point in the bag, I, I can't remember which game it was on the weekend, but um, Crusaders Kings. Yeah, that's the one. And they, um, de they definitely held back, and then obviously they they, they wanted to put that blind Blylandale, whatever his name is, on, at fly half, and he was terrible. Yeah, that's basically send out the white flag when you send him on, don't you? Um, and, what um, happened to Matt Burquist? Why can they can't bring him back? <laughs> I'm not sure what's happened to Matt. We're going to have to get hold of maybe Johnny King. I'm sure he, he's probably still got Matt's number. I'm and, really uh, struggling with keeping this show towards two hours. We get Johnny in here, nobody would talk. <laughs> I'm sure Matt Burquist is running a kicking clinic somewhere around New Zealand. Um, yeah, so like uh, my whole point was that the Crusaders got the four tries. They got the bonus point. There's no other big incentive. They're always going to win that match. It makes for a very boring and dull second half. 
I use the analogy on my on my my site, uh, the Bounce Set Z A, is that you know when you get those one sided one day internationals where Sri Lanka scores three twenty and then suddenly Bangladesh or seventy three for eight, you know they'll just dick around for like two hours and you know Shastri's even falling asleep. I think rugby games are going to go like that because teams are going to get weaker, especially as the tournament progresses, and then you've got no incentive for the guys to keep hammering on. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it it will definitely provide something extra. You know, I mean, you see, like a team like the Chiefs, just with the four tribe um, bonus point, how you know you can actually lose a couple of games and still be ahead of guys that have won more games than you just by sure by by, by scoring the tries. And and I think providing that extra incentive would um, would certainly add to add to things. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm sure the Northern Hemisphere boys would probably hate the idea. But um, I think there's some merit in, in, in having a go. I certainly think there's more merit in that than what the Varsity Cup does, where you see last night um, the Mighties beating NMMU. But if you'd used the traditional scoring method, uh, PE or well, UPE would have, would have come. Uh, I mean, farcical. No, it's completely farcical, but I try not to touch on that Varsity Cup stuff. But I think another really good point is as you get to the business end of tournaments, when suddenly a team needs, okay, let me just look, go, go back to what the Bulls needed. They needed a score difference, I think it was 2006, 2005, whatever it was, when they beat Queensland uh, 92-6. You know, yeah. if it gets to the point where the team suddenly needs seven points to get to the finals, and they now need to know, they have to score eight tries, it'll definitely bring another dynamic into the match. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I suppose in some ways, um, the whole points different thing um, kind of looks after this idea that you should probably keep going, you know, and, and keep um, increasing the amount of points you've got because it's, you know, how, how many times have we seen points difference come into it? It, it happens fairly often. Yeah. So I suppose there is actual incentive there, but we've got to understand rugby players are, are not the brightest guys and I don't think they've worked this out yet. But they do have good coaching staff, and they're all mic'd up, and you can have you can have disco lights come back from from Rusty patent pending, um, just to come through and show them that they need two more tries for another point. But yeah, I, think, I mean, we're gonna have to keep an eye on a guy like Pierre Spies, you know, when he's he's gonna be asking. Well, it's not that you don't already. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these guys instead of just counting to four, they're gonna have to learn how to count to eight. Yeah, but okay. So, so where would we go? Would the extra bonus point come in at say six tries, or would it should be for like an extra double? So after eight tries, you get that second bonus point. No, I think the the, the double is is probably the way to go. Um, I'm also, you know, the, another thing that I that I hate is this this losing bonus point story where you see mm. guys kicking for poles um, to secure a losing bonus point. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not I'm not sure how we sort that out. Apparently, there's a bonus point system held over in Northern Hemisphere somewhere, and I'm very ignorant towards Northern Hemisphere rugby because, well, quite frankly, there's only so much sport I can watch. But apparently, if you score more tries than the other guys, regardless of what the numbers are, you get a bonus point for that. If you score, say, three tries more than your opponents. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, that, that sounds... Well, I mean, rugby is about, about scoring the tries, isn't it? So, well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think as far as all these new rules are coming in to try to speed the game up, this is a very quick fix. All you say is, okay, just score more tries. I'm not going to bother about having another rock law or another, like, more law, whatever it is. If you get more tries, you get more points. As simple as that. Teams will then figure out how to do that themselves. I think the game will be much better off for it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I certainly think it's, um, it, it's, it's worth pursuing. You know, the, the Sanzar guys, listen, they... If they can bring about a ref cam, they can certainly bring about an extra bonus point. Yeah, well, it's not yeah. hard. I mean, you could even give the refs a different symbol for they're going for the second bonus point and make it a power play if they want. But now this is the thing. I had a poll on uh, on the bounce of the day. Uh, should an extra eight try bonus point be added? 62% of you said yes. 26% of you said no, which is quite interesting. And then the other option was, it's a slippery slope from here if we add this. And there was 12% of the people voted on that. Because essentially, what, you, know, you don't want to reinvent the game. You know? And when this sort of happens, if we have a second bonus point, suddenly there'll be some other trivial thing coming together. You, know, before, you never want to get to the point where it's varsity cup rugby. And I think that that's probably the, the biggest um, issue with adding something new like a double bonus point. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's definitely worth looking at, I think. And they should probably look at it. But I think uh, Mornay... I think it was Mornay who made the point uh, quite a while ago, I think sometime last year, where he said, you know, the, the whole points difference story can cater for this sort of thing, yeah? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's, if I'm 100% convinced, but I think it's, it's worth something, you know? We, we don't want to see games petering out where, like the, 
you know, I think the only reason the Sharks kept going against the Rebels is, um, you know, they haven't scored a try for about three years. <laughs> so, so they were just having fun, you know. But, um, yeah, if we can get the guys more incentivized, I don't see why why we should take it off the table. Great. Well, quite unanimous between the two of us, which makes up a panel today. Simply Sean will be back next week. He is, like I said, um, investigating Ravi Shastri's family tree today. It's an interesting assignment. I'm not sure how he came about that. But you know what Sean is. He's a very interesting kind of sporting... Um, this is called him a purist. Um, Billy, we're going to just go on to the games of the weekend. Obviously, we've got the big Easter weekend. Um, something that I really do look forward to every year is the Easter weekend up here in Joburg. There's the three big rugby festivals happening. I'm going to go to the St. Stidian's one, my, um, my old school of Weinberg Boys High, the prodigious academy of, um, well, that's basically where Shark Callis came from. He was a very talented fly half back in the day. Middle parting, took the line hard. <laughs> uh, they're playing against you know a whole host of other things. So just Google Easter Rugby School Festival and you'll be amazed. It's always really good, even if you just want to go for the beer. It's always a good weekend out. But in saying that, there's obviously another full weekend of Super Rugby. So I'm just going to go through the fixtures and we can just quickly touch on it before we get into gears with uh, Sasha and Daisy, who are in the studio as always, bright, early, brimming and excited. Uh, I'm just talking about Dai, of course. Sasha's just here because, well... I don't know. He wants to hang out with Daisy and Simon. So getting to the first fixture of the weekend. Let me just pull it up here on my screen. Highlanders versus the Reds. Are the Highlanders finally going to win a game? Yes, I, I've backed them so often. I think from week one, I was backing the guys. So I'm going to stick with, with, with form and say the Reds. <laughs> this game, of course, is being played at the home of the Highlanders. So I'm going to go with Highlanders in this one. It has to happen. You know, Blind squirrels and nuts and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, the next match up is Saturday at 5.35. First game, obviously, on the Friday, 8.35. Next one up is Hurricanes versus the Kings. Now, getting back to that bonus point thing, you know, as you know, I had this bet with Betos It was for the Kings to take 100 points. I tell you what, when the Crusaders <laughs> warmed up against them last week, I thought it could be in the money there. Um, Hurricanes, a bit more unpredictable. They'll definitely give it a run from absolutely everywhere. That, that's just the nature of their play. What do you reckon the points difference is going to be here? Um, well, you've you got to factor in that the Kings, up until the, the Crusaders game, had the best defense and tackle effectiveness in the whole competition mm, fair at enough. sort of 93% or something, um, which, was, which was impressive. So, you know, they're certainly not total walkovers, um, but I would say hurricane, Hurricanes by 12. Hurricanes by 12. Well... I don't know. I've just got this feeling the floodgates are going to burst at some stage. And if it's not this week, it's definitely next week against the Brumbies. These Oaks, they've just got, they got such a mountain ahead of them. But yeah, they just keep impressing. So, look, I'm going to say Hurricanes are going to... They, they're going to post the first 50 against them. Hard. 15 above. Uh, next game, Chiefs versus the Blues. 8.35, Saturday morning. Got to go with Chiefs here. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely stick with Chiefs. Uh, Sir John's still got some work to do there, I think. Yeah, I think it's... Um, well, Mone said it wasn't so much a false dawn, it's just that they are going through... They've got good players, but it just came unstuck in the last two weeks. Following that, at 10.40, we've got the Brumbies versus the Bulls. Again, Brumbies have just come back from quite a tough tour. Obviously, they'll be quite fatigued, but I still think they'll have enough to take on the Bulls here. Yeah, I mean, two very different teams. Um, and, yeah, I think Brumbies at home. Yep, okay, unanimous on that one. Next up, then we get into some interesting matches here. Oh, hang on a second. Am I even looking at the right thing? Yes, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cheaters. <Cheetahs>. Daisy distracting <laughs> you again. As always. Uh, next up is the 5 o'clock match. It's the Cheaters versus the Rebels. I'm not wearing my Jake White glasses today, so I just looked at something different. <laughs> cheaters versus the Rebels. Cheaters, again, they're going to give a good PK to the Rebels. Yeah, they've got it. I mean... Just what a tour they've had. Huh? Yeah, some momentum again, just like the Brumbies, they've travelled, but it'll still be too good. And then we've got the cracker of the weekend, 30th of March, 7 10, Stormers versus the Crusaders. Or should I say Crusaders versus Stormers? You normally always list the home team first. Yeah, um, Crusaders at home. Um, <laughs> at home in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it kind of neutralizes things. Um, it's a tough one, huh? But. You know, the Stormers looked good against the Brumbies and... Um, and the Chiefs. Yeah, so... And then those are two, you know, leading sides. So, I think the Stormers might have turned the corner and I think they'll be too good for the Crusaders. 
Okay, I'm going with Stormers as well on that one. You can read more about um, the Cape Crusaders and their dilemmas at the moment on the bounce.co.za. It's one of our headline pieces. And the final match of the weekend, we have another Sunday match, which means you will not be watching it. But anyway, it is the Waratahs versus the Force. Waratahs? No? Yes? Ah, uh, jeepers. I certainly won't be waking up for that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, let's, let's do it for Camper and so the Waratahs. Indeed. Okay, Billy, we'll cut you off there. Sasha is laptop in hand which is called a laptop or something else actually <laughs> and uh, away we go another episode of uh, blogs on balls you can c- catch the, the show on balls.co.za underneath the blog section stay tuned for gears with Sasha and Daisy and of course the afternoon team 3 to 6 you can catch them on FM 93.8 and you can catch them live on boards.co.za. Catch you back next week. Thanks for listening. I have been at Follow the Bounce on Twitter with Sport Billy Says and watch out for the podcast coming up soon. Thanks so much. Check you next week. Oh, crap, I pressed the wrong button again. <laughs> this is going so badly. <laughs> uh, um, Billy, have you got a joke? <laughs> uh, no, not offhand. Not offhand. We're going to need one. I've just, I've just minimized the entire playlist. <laughs> Ah, uh, Jasler. This is Will. He's not helping me. That's the button there. Okay. Catch you back next week. Cheers.